What's shaking and baking, my marketing people? Welcome to another episode of the Mind Your Marketing Podcast. Today, joining us is Elizabeth. <clears throat> I'm going to start again already. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the show. Today, joining us is the SVP of Marketing at Civic Financial Services, Elizabeth Hillestad. Elizabeth, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Jordan. How are you? I am doing well. I'm excited to have you on the show. Talk all things marketing and how to build out the perfect marketing machine, what we talked about off air. But before we do that, I want to throw the ball back to you. It's in your court. Talk to me about your journey. How did you find your way into marketing and ultimately to Civic? All right. Well, thanks, Jordan. I've always loved technology. And so I got my start in marketing in the mid 80s, way before the internet with a company called Blue Chip Computers. And we competed against Big Blue. And for those of you who don't know what that is, that's IBM. They were the main maker of PCs at the time. So it was really an exciting time to be in tech. And at Blue Chip, we launched the first computer into the retail market, into stores like Target. Um, so otherwise, you had to go to a computer store or Radio Shack to get a PC. So I've been doing this a long, long time. And... Um, from there, during the dot-com boom, I joined a roll-up with Virgin Entertainment Group called Virgin Jamcast, which was the first digital music download platform before iTunes. Um, and one of the coolest things we did there was launching the first concert webcast, which was a Ben Harper webcast from Paris to 18 million viewers across five continents. Today, that seems normal. But in 2000, that was the first of its kind. Today, we call that live streaming technology happens every day. So there's been a lot of um, changes in tech, obviously, since then. But what I've found in marketing is that the same principles hold true through time and iteration. And like I said, I've been in the space for 30 years, I've worked in technology, healthcare, and now in financial services for a mortgage company. Yeah, it's it's interesting. And, you know, it's funny, as you were saying that, I was writing down the word principles. And because anyone who's been in the game for a while, as you go from, a comp in, in, you know, company to company, or as uh, technology evolves, to your point, it really is about how do you apply the principles and the philosophy of marketing, um, the way of thinking to a problem set that your customer is facing or your business is facing and then pushing through? So I think if you take that approach first, that uh, it, it then makes the problems more approachable or any of the struggles that, you know, the customer be facing a little bit more approachable. Absolutely. Um, you know, everything that's old is new again. And we just are applying it to different medium, different messages. And while we're being, our customers are being bombarded with messages and advertising, what we always need to maintain is that empathy for the customer and the customer experience. And if you as a company and as a marketing team can rally around the customer, you really have a chance at building that perfect marketing machine. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, the old is the, the old marketing is the new marketing. It's so true. You hear things like people are obsessed with influencer marketing, like it's something new. And I'm like, that's called spokespeople. Um, yeah. <laughs> back in the day when you saw a professional athlete in front of a car on TV, that that was influencer marketing. Um, yeah, it, it's interesting. And now, like you said, right, it's when you have these problem sets and then looking at how do you apply or build out this marketing machine behind it that's really customer centric and helping that customer get from their point A to their point B. Um, talk to me a little bit about that because I, I know that there's really two components to the machine. Um, walk me through how you see that and how it works out in organizations. Sure. Well, really in um, building a marketing operation, and, and I've done this probably a dozen times over my 30-year career, um, have gone into companies where and either built a marketing team from the ground up or inherited a marketing team and worked with existing technology. And in every single one of those scenarios, have had to look at the same three things, people, processes, and technology. And it really starts with the team. Um, you can have the greatest technology in the world, 
you can have the greatest marketing automation system, you can have the greatest CRM, you can have all of these technology pieces operating. But if you have um, a team that's not all in, that's not committed, if you haven't built your team to share those customer centric philosophies, to understand that we're not here uh, for ourselves, we're here to drive business, then it doesn't matter what technology you have. You can, I've seen the greatest technology fail because of the team. Conversely, I've seen an amazing team make really powerful strides with really average and sometimes even bad technology. So, you know, you have to have um, both of those things in alignment in order to succeed. And then you have to have, you know, really clear, uh, marketing automation platform that can streamline all your marketing, whether it's print, digital, social, email marketing, to really activate the marketing throughout the entire customer experience. So all of these things working together uh, create a synergy. It's kind of the trifecta effect uh, that can be really powerful. Yeah, it's huge. You know, it makes me think about uh, there's this story in the book, Extreme Ownership, about the Navy SEALs, where they have teams that go out and they race these boats out to a point in the water and they come back. And they all have the same technology, right? The boats and the paddles. Um, but when they sub out certain team members and put them on different teams, suddenly that leadership changes and people are all now rowing in the same direction. They take their individual egos out of it. And they found that if they took one leader and move them from team to team, that that team would continue to win. And I love that anecdote because I think it's so applicable to business where, hey, the people, if we're aligned, if we're all rowing in the same direction, we can get to our destination and we can help our customer get to the destination. But when we have ego get in um, and we start to think that the product is greater than the customer or we start to have a which I've seen before when we've gone in consulting like a resentful relationship with the customer. It's very odd when companies start complaining about their yeah, customers. Yeah, like they're a pain in our butt. Yeah, it's like, why are we in business if you don't like your customer? <laughs> like, <laughs> So I, I, I think that that's, and I wanted to kind of expand on that because I think it's so important for anyone listening that you really have to fall in love with the customer and fall in love with helping them. And if that is the, the lead... Everything else in behind it is, you know, is the cherry on top, is the is the thing that can take you to the next level. But without that foundational point, I think to your to your point, it's you're going to be hard pressed to get success. Um, yeah. Now, or sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say one of the things we, that I was mentioning before is, you know, even in the content we create, your customers don't care about what you do and what you have to say. Um, they want to know how you're going to solve their problem. They care about what they need. And so it's really important for us as marketers to try to create these personalized and relevant experiences for them. Try to turn your content creators into experience makers. You know, if you look at all the touch points throughout your customer's journey, you know, they see a bajillion ads they might be searching, they might be on social, they choose you, they click on you, they, they somehow, um, you know, your, your content folks have slowed the scroll enough to get them to click, right? Now, your job is to engage with them. People want to do business with people they know, like, and trust. So you have an opportunity to do that. But you can't do that by talking about how great your product is. First, you got to understand what their needs are. And, um, you know, nobody ever said, gee, I'm really glad to get this automated email from this CRM system. We have a philosophy that friends don't CRM friends. And the point of that is, you know, we can use marketing to humanize and personalize experiences and not just automate them. So people oftentimes think about, you know, marketing automation is automating all these processes. It's like, no, how can we make um, our touch points with our customers more humanistic? And sometimes that means 
taking the marketing message out. You know, it might be through things like this with podcasts and webinars and videos. And maybe it's, we have to set an appointment or send a task to a sales guy to make a phone call. Remember phone calls? You know, how can we follow up and engage with our customers? That's the job of marketing. It's to support sales and make sure that we talk like humans, not like businesses. Just to ramble on one more second, to prepare for this, I was um, reading a blog from arguably one of the leading marketing automation companies. And I read this blog and I'm thinking, I can't even understand what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. It was like word salad, you know, with buzzwords and big words and sentences that I'm sure somebody thought was smart, but, you know, just talk to people like people, build that rapport and that relationship. You know, you want to make them ultimately trust you, but that's a progression. And, you know, you got to go from awareness, interest, action, you know, to really touch um, them emotionally because people make decisions emotionally and then they rationalize those decisions with logic and statistics and facts and all of those things. So, you know, our job is in as marketers is really challenging, but having that empathy for the customer is job one. And for us, that's why the whole customer experience department resides in marketing. So we are responsible for the entire customer journey from the time that we can touch them with um, a marketing message to the time that we can uh, connect with them for another opportunity to do business with them. Yeah, it's, it's spot on. And I think you said something really interesting there where it's like, okay, Having a machine, you know, you can have touch points, human touch points, and still have a system, right? And it's using the system to facilitate these human touch points. For instance, um, who here is listening? And, you know, if you're in your car, keep your hands on the wheel. But if you're just walking around in your office, you know, raise your hand. You might look silly. But who here has gotten an e-card at Christmas, some generic e-blast Christmas card? It's like the least personalized thing in the world where... On the other side, if we write out a Christmas card to somebody, the chances of that being read and someone actually going, whoa, Johnny wrote me the Christmas card, and I feel warm and fuzzy now that when I'm receiving this on December 10th or whatever it may be, um, that's the feeling we want to invoke. And we can take that over to what we do with our company. So, hey, salesperson, call. Hey, let's send a personalized note, right? Let's do things that help the business is here to facilitate something, but really it's a person working with a person on each side. And the human side can really connect and say, hey, we're here to help you. I think to Civic, for instance, right? And for anyone listening, here, here's a prime example. Civic, private money lending to real estate investors. And to some marketers, they might say, well, how do you market that? And the first inclination is to go rates and product line and all of this stuff. But if you take one step further and go, our customers care about their legacy, building wealth, passive income, lifestyle. How do we tap into those, right? And then work backwards. When they get into consideration phase, all, the, all those you know features are, are going to come in, but we have to sell and communicate those value sets first. Like, hey, this is the life it creates for you, the consumer who's worried about X, Y, and Z. Um, I think that's so important. Yeah, that's 100% right. And those really are um, our key messages. That's our red thread is helping our customers build wealth. And we look at that throughout um, that customer's journey. They might be a very first time investor. So you talk to that person very differently than you do to someone who's a legacy investor who's been doing this for 30 years that wants to turn it over to their kids someday. And being able to understand your customers, that takes work. I mean, we have dug into the data. We understand our customers and who they are and what matters to them and what are the pain points in our process. And they differ uh, for different customer personas. The new investor um, actually the the very first time investor for us has 
uh, gives us the highest NPS score because they don't know what to expect. But repeat borrowers expect more. You know, they expect going the extra mile. So we talk to them, we treat them differently because it is, a, you know, like many companies, a repeat business business. We want them to keep coming back. So how do we treat that not like a transaction? How do we build that customer for life um, philosophy? And we do that throughout our entire organization. And that would be something I would say is, is key to this, that that starts at the top, that leadership philosophy, that customer for life mentality. A lot of companies pay lip service to that. Not a lot of people walk the talk. And I uh, am really grateful to be at a company that really does walk the talk. You know, we look at our customer satisfaction results, our NPS scores, and even our NPS scores like net, 91, uh, which is off the charts, we always look at how we can improve. And from a marketing standpoint, where can communication and marketing help throughout that process to clarify communications, to set expectations, to show our gratitude to them? So there's a touch point, a communication uh, throughout every aspect of our customer's journey. I love it. And I love that last part, show gratitude, like even where to show gratitude, right? Truly just thanking customers. Hey, thank you for choosing us and not, and then not trying to upsell, just saying tr yep, true thank just you. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth, this has been awesome. Uh, I learned a lot before I let you go, let people know where they can learn more about civic and connect with you online. Sure. Civicfs.com. Um, and you can email me at elizabeth.hillestad at civicfs.com. would love to share my tips and tricks from doing this uh, building marketing operations for the last 30 years and help anybody out who has questions. Amazing. You got it. And if you got questions, head over, shoot Elizabeth an email. Um, don't try to sell her anything, listeners. Don't come <laughs> in hot with trying to sell nothing. I'll hear about it. Um, no. uh, thanks again for coming on. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jordan. It's been a pleasure. Uh, all right, everybody, that's it for this episode. As always, I'm your host, Jordan Shelton, and I'll catch you next time.